All right. We are here. Episode two um, of Cyber Series, Diversa style. Um, Reed, glad you can join us. Um, Good to be here. Yeah, no, I, I know. I mean, we've got tons to talk about, especially, you know, your positions, working government, obviously in uh, national security, as well as, you know, former Goldman Sachs for quite a long time and seeing a couple of different uh, iterations of what has evolved when it comes to banking, tech, everything kind of matched into, into the middle and then how that plays onto the broader theater of security, whether it's national security or just security initiatives within companies. So appreciate you carving out the time and glad you're here. Great. I'm happy to be here and uh, enjoyed working with you guys on uh, projects in the past. Yeah, absolutely. And I know there's, there's a lot of, uh, you probably bring a little bit of a different edge to the table given compared to where we're spending our time um, in these podcasts, which is what does the global scale of national security from a government standpoint look like? But then how does that evolve into just general best practices into each and every single company security protocol? Yep. So, um, you know, we'll touch on a couple of different subjects today. Obviously, yep. the, the big elephant in the room as it relates to U.S.-China relations. But, um, yeah, I'd love to start off and, you know, I guess, I mean, there's a lot, lot to cover. So when you think about what's going on today as it pertains to, we could talk about, um, you know, Russia and Ukraine. We could talk about China and wh where data sits and how to actually tack data as a company. Why don't we start there? What, what are your thoughts as we as enterprises start to attack that problem on a global scale? Yeah, sure. Um, I, most of my comments will probably be uh, slanted towards U.S. China relations, just given that's my experience. And obviously yep. it's quite prominent in, in everything from D.C. discussions to boardroom discussions. Um, Right now, the macro environment is probably worth starting there. It's no secret to anyone. It's it's souring. Uh, both Beijing and D.C. Uh, are increasingly distrustful of one another. And we're seeing that not just in the words spoken, but in the actions taken, both in terms of new laws and new new policies um, that are adopted in Beijing and D.C. And so I think it's important for every company and investor out there in the tech space to be up to speed on it. And I've found in my experiences over the last probably 18 months uh, since uh, I've started working with companies after coming out of government is that most boards and executive, um, executive teams are probably not as up to speed as they should be because the geopolitics are increasingly going to shape their activity. And so I think you know, at the macro level, um, uh, my own view is that things are probably just going to deteriorate further between China and the United States. And that's particularly going to impact um, cross-border flows of data and information, and then also even capital. Uh, yeah. And so that, that hits both the investor community and the company, uh, the corporate side. Now, you brought up to me in a prior conversation where we're tending as a as a um as a civilization like moving away from globalization and into blocks as it pertains to security yeah. um can, what walk me through what you mean by that so back in the cold war there there were trade blocks and i, I think we're moving back in that direction now except the trade blocks are going to impact less uh, physical goods and far and impact far more uh, data and capital. So uh, what do I mean by that? Right now, if you take a look at new laws and regulations that have been introduced by Beijing over the last basically two years, you have the cybersecurity law of 2017. Uh, you have the, um, uh, that's a national intelligence law of 2017. You have the cybersecurity law, you have the data security law, you have the personal information protection law. What, are, what is this, uh, lattice work of regulation do, it basically blocks uh, the outbound flow of information from China out, outbound. It captures data, foreign data that's currently um, stored in China, in China, and it increasingly it creates new friction 
costs um, for cross-border flows of data. In the U.S., similar regulation policies are being put in, into place. Uh, I think just yesterday, the White House endorsed a new piece of draft legislation that was introduced by Senator Warner, who's on the Intelligence, Senate Intelligence Committee, which would uh, enable um, the executive branch using a new policy that came under, uh, that was introduced under the Trump administration, but has been adopted and endorsed by the Biden administration called the ICTS um, yep. executive order, which would effectively allow the U.S. government to in increasingly regulate foreign uh, communication platforms, media platforms operating in the United States in the digital space. In in addition, there's all these other laws that have been put into place or new policies have been put in place in D.C. So everything from the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, which is going to impact the, the cross-border flow of physical goods to um, to uh, CFIUS, to reverse CFIUS. So there's been discussion recently, uh, a lot of discussion in D.C., and I'm sure it's actually being picked up, particularly in Silicon Valley, of a new law that could come into place law or regulation. We don't know which way uh, that's going to go at the moment. Um, that would impact for U.S. investment going into China. And so it would either prohibit or at a minimum limit where that capital is going. And that would that would have a big impact on some of the large large venture capital firms, but also a lot of U.S. companies that invest in those. Spaces. Sure. So what you're seeing across the board in summary is um, Walls are being erected, basically, through new yeah. law. Uh, walls are being erected through laws and regulation that increasingly are going to limit and regulate cross-border flows bilaterally, both capital and information between China and the U.S. But importantly, it also is going to start creating new ecosystems or blocks, if you will, uh, for the flow of capital and flow of information. So. Uh, if we erect certain, we, the U.S., erect certain walls around information flows, um, we most certainly, our government, is going to put pressure on other allies and partners of ours to make similar lim uh, limitations such that there's not backdoor vulnerabilities or other areas to exploit um, yep. U.S. data. So it's happening in real time, and I expect in probably five years, we are going to wake up in a situation where there will be de facto trade blocks just in yeah. information and capital space. Yeah. Do you, a question for you, as you were saying, uh, as you were running through that, do you, in your experience, obviously, you know, private sector, public sector combined, do you think U.S.-based companies, and I'm not just talking tech companies, I'm talking yeah. consumer goods, manufacturing um, because of this kind of reverse engineering of the globalization movement, um, and it's happening pretty quickly, do you think U.S. companies are prepared for that journey over the next, let's just say, 12, 18, 24 months where tensions will continue to rise? Do you think U.S. companies in your work are prepared to face that or no? So I would say in the this quarter, Q1 of 2023, I would say increasingly so. If yeah. you were to ask that question Q1 last year, I would say absolutely not. I think a lot of a lot of companies, boards, and you know, investors have increasingly come to the view that uh, in new or increased investment into, say, the China market um, is increasingly risky, and. Um, yeah, that again, it's just because people are watching what's happening in Beijing, D.C. What I would say, though, is uh, there is a lag. So, uh, you know, I served on a board last year. I've done some work with various tech companies, um, big, some of our largest tech companies and some consulting work. And I've found that they tend to be a few months behind the actual dialogue in both Beijing yep. and D.C. And so, in a way, it, it behooves C-suites and boards uh, to, if they haven't already, to put on the board agenda at some point, you know, this coming, you know, this winter, spring, uh, discussion about geopolitics and how that's going to impact opportunity costs, impact growth, uh, plan, so risk management. Okay. Now, 
I know that there there's some example of companies. It's not like, at least in, in my observation, it's not like there's just overwhelming amount of companies that have called R and D centers in China. But you do have companies, especially in tech. But I think just as Jason was saying, companies in general that do have engineering based in China that are really headquartered here. Obviously, we know that that's going to be a much more complicated situation as the years go on. But what does that mean for companies that are that have R and D in the region. Obviously, we see a lot of R and D companies that are in India, which is, you know, close by. But also, you don't. Is this going to be a broader kind of bring back R and D and engineering back to the U S. Um, as well as ceasing operations within areas like China? Totally. Like, right. do you I feel think. Like or pendulum effect is what I'm saying. So I think just like supply chains, also corporate R and D. Uh, headquarters or bases will get relocated uh, to yeah. countries outside of China slowly, in some instances quickly, but you know, over time, over the coming two years, I think they'll get relocated probably for most companies in a way that the R&D at first is done in parallel or dupl it's duplicative um, that protects against risk of having that R&D kind of sealed off or unable to access it uh, in China, for example. Um, but um, I think it's, it will just get first and foremost diversified. My sense is most of the R&D uh, that is underway by the large U.S. leading tech companies, software companies, if you will, semiconductor, the leading R&D, the, you know, the tip of the spear is not being done in China. It's largely, that's maybe a, a generation back, but um, that is probably particularly directed to the China market, given the set of regulations there differ a bit from, from our own and, and other jurisdictions. That said, I think companies increasingly need to realize that that R&D um, is probably not as protected as they may think. Right. Um, and then on top of it in China, and, and, and to be fair, conversely, China probably quite justifiably would think that the R&D of Chinese companies offshore may not be quite as protected as they think. Right. Um, and so I think you're just going to see duplication and, and or relocation of some of that R&D to allied or partner countries. Yeah. I, in India, I would even course, say, you know, with India right now already. Yeah. I mean, I would look, I have a client uh, I'm doing a CEO search for and all the R&D is in Thailand. And I got news yeah. for you. One of the requirements of the incoming CEO is we're going to move that R&D out of Thailand and for obvious reasons. Yeah. Well, it's interesting. I, I would have in Thailand. I certainly a destination for new R&D Vietnam, um, but increasingly it's India. And I think in part it's that Western companies, U S companies can get comfortable with some of the infrastructure there and the rules there. Yeah. I mean, there's there's problems around data localization in India, but um, that currently is being reviewed and we expect legislation at some point, probably this year on, on data localization in India. All that said, um, India, from what I'm seeing, is increasingly kind of the redirect jurisdiction yeah. for uh, R&D that previously was done in China. That where makes you, sense. Where do you feel like US companies will in making a move like that or redirecting their investments um, in the coming years, that's not in China. Where do you feel like there are going to be, um, call it blind spots or moves that you'd anticipate that people would think that, okay, this is the next best thing, but they might get like, where are the other challenges that are on the other side of the fence that people aren't thinking about when you are moving capital, you are moving, where your R and D organization is going big? Well, I, in a way, I'd almost uh, direct that back to you all, or at least this is the area you play in, which is personnel. So, who's running? If you're going to start redirecting R and D centers and supply chains, um, let's face it: uh, if you're creating dependencies, um, supply chain dependencies, what have you in new jurisdictions, you got to trust who's running those businesses and managing sure. those teams. And, you know, my time in finance uh, previously, it was always discussion um, in at headquarters around who's running some of these businesses in places around, you know, the other side of the world. Um, you know, 
do they adopt the culture that we want? Um, are they properly managing, and this is a big one, the risk, corporate risk, um, you know, yeah. reputational risk. These are big, big issues right now um, as companies, I'm sure uh, it's big issues in, in boards as people start redirecting supply chains. And I suspect you all will see that in your engagements with, with um, clients as they look to identify new executive talent in different areas. Well, yeah, I, I was going to say, I think the number one risk is, like you said, when you take an R&D operation that is mainland China based, right? Um, you got to make sure you set it up around the right people. Um, yeah. Obviously, with India being a really strong redirect um, for those operations, uh, you know, it's certainly in my view, Joe, it's it kind of lends itself to like there could be a talent boom and a talent need in India for yeah. You know, engineering and R and D folks um, that some could be based here that want to go back to India and, and run those operations, but alternatively, um, it's going to build. It's going to be built around the the talent pool that can run those operations in another country. Yeah. Well, I think you're seeing some companies uh, just even in the last couple of years that have just recently went IPO that you know operations or or really leadership operations are actually predominantly based still in India. You even see startups as early as, you know, 20, 30, 40 person companies that are extending go to market here, but you still have predominant leadership yeah. that's still based in India. And they're actually more and more comfortable with it nowadays because they know the ecosystem is just getting richer there. Uh, and I think it's only going to continue to get that. I think that is probably going to be not a lot of people realize. I know there's a big boom in Europe with companies that are, you know, dual headquarters between New York, Boston, London, and places in Germany, but India, India is starting to become that. Um, it always had a presence from a, hey, we have our founders stem from there or engineering stem from there, but now it's actually becoming like a realistic hub in terms of that's where operations is stemming from. So I, I think that redirection is only gonna continue to fill that funnel even more. Yeah. And I think this is where, um, you know, Joe, we've, we've done some, worked on some projects around SISO searches. Um, as companies start redirecting against supply chains, R&D centers, corporate compliance is so critical. And sure. uh, it's usually an afterthought until a crisis <laughs> happens. Right. And so it would behoove boards to, to elevate and prioritize corporate compliance as they do this, which then comes down to people and then also mm -hmm. the policies and processes in place and making sure that they're followed in these new, you know, these new yep. markets that they're going into. Because boy, I, I've just seen these things often end in tears before they get corrected. Yep. You know, around corporate compliance. Yeah. Yep. What are the, um, what are probably the two or three things as it pertains to corporate compliance that you are like, these are just, just pain points as I walk in the door that should have been resolved easily uh, within companies yeah. that you feel just U.S. companies in general need to, you know, start to get in order? Well, uh, I mean, it, it, it's in part the answer to this, from my experience, is specific to industry. But, you know, some right. general ones is one information security management. Boy, you know, a lot of companies run afoul when they go into new markets and they're not yeah. you know, the, the individuals in those those markets are not following procedures and policies uh, that are in place at the corporate level to uh, use of social media standards. And um, I think adherence to standards differ geographically. And so, you know, this is where companies will start, um, will start getting nervous around reputation risk, you know, and, and uh, when in my time in financial services, uh, it was pretty well understood in the U.S. on what one should do and not do on social media. You go to some emerging markets and they were, you know, it required some both scrutiny and some correction uh, on what, on how people are using social media, um, you know, particularly uh, with the U.S. or with a company's brand in the background or what have you, or affiliated, you know, putting an affiliation in on their Instagram or TikTok account affiliated with a company and then doing kind of stupid stuff. So this is all, yeah. you know, these are, I, I could probably go on, there's probably five or 10 things, but these are things where I've just seen problems arise and it creates reputational risk or yep. security risk. 
Yeah. Go, I, I, I question just kind of popped into my head because uh, obviously you have deep expertise in U.S. China uh, interrelations. Um, like, do you see, particularly with the deteriorating relationship that is, in my view, I pay pretty close attention to it. I'm a, I'm a army brat by trade. Um, and, uh, I, you know, uh, I was having a conversation with my dad not too long ago that it is accelerating. The deterioration is accelerating pretty quickly um, uh, right in front of our eyes. Like, do you do you see a time where literally the, there's a line in the sand that like if you're a U.S. based company, you cannot or will not have operations in China and inversely. If you're a Chinese-based company, you cannot, will not have a division or anything in the United States. Do you think that has a, there's a risk of that happening in the near future? Uh, I think it depends on industry. And, and I'm, I'm talking policy, you know, on every angle. Yeah. Uh, well, I guess to frame the discussion, uh, there has been recent leaks or publications of views of military leadership uh, and national security leadership on um, U.S. military leadership and national security leadership on expected time frames for if there were to be a conflict over Taiwan, when would that occur? Yep. And it's all kind of gravitating in around 2025 to 2025. Yeah, 2025. And, yep. And that's kind of moved, that has moved over the last few years, moved forward from 2030. Uh, so it's important for companies to understand where the current thinking is uh, right. in DC. Um, to uh, think what we're seeing, what we saw with Russia was that Russia trapped a lot of corporate, you, foreign corporate assets. So when there was yep. conflict and sides were taken, uh, President Putin made decisions to trap certain assets, uh, which I believe was probably intended to, to put corporate pressure on political leadership in various countries to change their policies. I think we, with a high degree of confidence, we should expect something similar if there yep. is conflict or near conflict with China. Uh, the China, Beijing has historically used corporate America as a channel for influence, for political influence in the United States. So um, what does that mean practically? Um, companies should probably assume that if there is military conflict with Taiwan, their assets in China will be trapped. They will not be able to get the cash offshore. They won't be able to get capital, other forms of capital and resources offshore. Um, and that will probably inform companies cash management in China, inform new and existing investment uh, in China. With, with trapped assets, I think that that's a fair assumption. And that um, and that's if our military leadership and national security leadership, um, their, the leaks and or the, uh, the public disclosures around the timing is accurate, we are a few years away. Yeah. So company, it, it behooves companies to start thinking about this now, not pushing yeah, it Yeah, it's, it, it's, really, it's really companies and boards that have assets, people, products that sell into or in mainland China, yep. um, they should be contingency planning is what you're saying. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So as you think about in that same time period, like percentages of, you know, what we're tying this back into, which is the, the world of a CISO um, or how companies think about their data, think about their vulnerability and, and compliance protocols. Like what is the percentage from a, call it global data protection scale that these executives will probably need to think about as the years go on? Like what's the shift in the balance act that they're going through, which I think every year it changes drastically, but I'm sure that's going to be even heightened more over the next three or four years. Uh, for sure. Uh, you're seeing it with, I assume in the last few years, your number of CISO hires and work has gone way up. Uh, so companies, I think, realize this. 
Um, I won't pretend to uh, pre pretend to know all the at the operational level the risks that some of these companies face from a governance level or a board level. Um, from what I've seen uh, directly and indirectly, um, you know, companies need to one they need to they need to have a CISO or information security uh, a senior executive in place. That individual I see this and I'm sure you do too. Those individuals need direct access to the CEO. For sure. Um, I, I equate the size. Unfortunately, it's, it's not as direct from a percentage perspective. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's getting better, but I agree with you. And, and if from an organizational efficiency perspective, CEOs want to put a CISO underneath, say, a COO, then the CEO, at a, in my mind, at a minimum, should avail him or herself to have bi-weekly or monthly catch-ups with the CISO one-on-one -on -one. because what that will do is if, if risks or vulnerabilities are being suppressed through layers of management, at least this, you know, such a procedure by allowing direct access, it will um, allow those issues to come out and get discussed properly. I've seen in a yep. few companies, the CISO gets buried. Um, yep. And then what ends up happening is all of the expertise gets filtered. Right? And that's not necessarily good. It actually creates risk rather than alleviates risk in a company. Yep. Um, and then two other things that I've, I've seen and or recommended uh, to, to companies is put a CISO on the board or an ex, you know, information security expert on the board. Uh, yep. In most companies, public companies, audit committees usually are the committees responsible for information, covering information security issues, but they don't do that great a job because the audit committee typically has a quite expansive set of responsibilities and they usually prioritize financials first. Correct. So creating an information security committee, even if you have it meet at a less with less periodicity than say the audit committee is a useful instrument. And then the last thing, which I think is, is good advice is in many companies that I've, I know of are doing it is hire an offensive um, cybersecurity firm, come in and test perimeter, et cetera. But what's important is the governance, as governance aspect of this. Reports from those, uh, those tests should go to the board. In fact, they should be required by the audit committee or the information security committee at the board. And they, the reports should go to the board. They shouldn't filter through the CEO per se. The CEO obviously needs to have visibility but the board needs visibility of it, uh, full yep. visibility as well. And so you know, those are the kind of things where I think it, um, it will alleviate or reduce risk, information security yep. risk in the system, just through, uh, just through improved governance um, yep. uh, rather than increase it. Yep. So okay. uh, I, I'd actually be curious, um, what are you hearing from, you know, Joe, we've worked on a few things together. You, you have a pretty extensive network with CISOs. What are you hearing on this, uh, this issue with relates, as it relates to governance? Are CISOs, do they think that they have the access they want to the CEO? I think some would say yes, some would say no. Um, I, agree, I agree with that. I think there's a, there's, a, um, there's a shift, and I think that's part of CISOs starting to advocate for themselves a little bit more. Yeah. And I think there's also, there's a lot of noise right now as it pertains to what is your toolkit from not only a security perspective, especially security perspective, but from a governance perspective. And there's, um, I think that market is evolving for the better, but it's still going to take time to understand what is, what is the best one, two, three step you need to take in terms of protocol, whether it's security, governance, communication within that world. Um, but I, I, this ranges from Fortune 50 companies all the way down to your, you know, fifty yeah. million dollar companies that CISOs either feel that they are empowered enough with the CEO to be able to communicate all the vulnerabilities that they see and take actionable insight on it, or you have the gaps of I don't really have an understanding of how this is getting sectioned off because there are gaps in communication amongst yep. what is we're supposed to do with this data. 
So uh, that's my observation. And Jay, I'm sure yeah. you. you yeah, it's 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 similar. The thing the the thing I would add uh, to answer your question, Reed, is um, there are patterns among you know certain companies where the CISO is empowered, reports to the CEO, yeah. has you know uh, gets an opportunity to go walk into the board meeting and talk about all of those things that Joe just mentioned. And there are there are certain factions and, and bubbles in companies where they still really are much more systems and inward focused, and they haven't been elevated to a strategic level. Yeah. Uh, to me, as somebody, I, I do a lot of CEO work, yeah. and you know, one of the things I always advise CEOs that I have relationships with is, um, you should be spending just like you said about ten minutes ago. Like you should have frequent meetings with your CISO. And the reason I say that is that creates the strategic communication channel that Joe just mentioned that isn't always there. So what I would tell you is I, I a good buddy of mine who's an investor who is a former CISO um, actually said something really interesting is that like CISOs in some instances are kind of becoming the next generation CIO. Because you're talking about business strategy, business operations, risk, compliance, and not just what software do we have in place to secure the perimeter to, you know, provide zero trust, you know, uh, two-factor authentication. So there's some elevation happening in the market, but it's still, in my view, as somebody Joe does more CISO work than I do specifically, but it's still. There are these pockets and bubbles where CISOs are treated as strategic leaders in an organization. And there's still pockets where they are really focused on, like I said, what's running, what are we stopping, et cetera. Yeah. Got it. So. Yeah. And it, you know, again, it behooves CEOs um, to treat the CISO higher and position as strategic because no question. Least, what we're seeing is it creates strategic risk for a breach, creates strategic risk for a company. I mean, reputational no, risk. No, strategic no risk. question. Yeah. You're, you're trying, it's just, you're seeing growing pains of going from, you know, triage specialist on the field to, yeah. you know, your, your fleet commander. And then your deputies yeah. are really acting as your triage specialist. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's the evolution of that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, there's, there's, you know, as, as we're just talking about this call, I mean, over the next couple of years, I think there's going to be a lot of forced conversations for the better, right. but, you know, it'll be interesting to see how that plays into the broader global theater that we're about to see from a geopolitical sure. standpoint. Yep. 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 So, yep. okay. Well, this has been, this has been awesome. Um, really appreciate you making the time. Um, sure. Yep. My pleasure. And it's, uh, it's, they're all important issues and companies increasingly need to be thinking about geopolitics. I mean, it's, it's going to shape their markets, their security, their information security, their hiring, everything. Uh, yeah. So. And, and like you said, when we first started this conversation, it's evolving quickly. Um, okay. And it's playing out, it's playing out like, look, it's playing out in the public forum. You can only imagine what's going on in the non-public forum, right? right. Um, uh, you know, the, the, the general public is not privy to the depth of the conversations that are being had and how that should impact um, policy, compliance strategy, what to do with your human capital, your employees, and how to, you know, how to adjust or set up your your data repositories, your systems, and how to protect yep. them. So it's uh, yeah. very helpful. Well, good. I, uh, again, enjoyed working with you all on, on projects, and I think this is a great series. So appreciate it.